And now it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Mike Vincent. All right, so here we see four snare. Um, it has a cost of three and is an item and a trap. Um, the trap synergy is something that's just been recently developed and so I think a lot of people are going to be using this card again uh, if they haven't played it in a while. It says attached to an enemy, engage with a player, attached enemy cannot attack. So certainly this card can be very handy, um, particularly if you're in an encounter with a few really nasty hard enemies with lots of hit points, lots of attack value, and you just can't have them engage you and attack you. So this way you can engage them, you can throw a force snare on them, and suddenly they just sit there engaged with you, unable to attack. This is nice, you can either leave them there uh, to deal with for later, or if you have someone like Legolas in play, you could pick away at that enemy and eventually kill them so you can make two progress. So for a snare, though it is a bit expensive, is very useful and can be a lifesaver, honestly, um, with the right encounter against the right enemy. Now it is worth keeping in mind that this card isn't always useful because it seems like a lot of the newer, really nasty enemies that have been included tend to have immunity to player cards or don't allow attachments. So in that case, you're going to have to find other tricks to deal with them. But certainly with the core set and with the first few expansions, there are lots of really bad enemies who you will engage who you can use this against. So for a snare, uh, particularly when you consider that new cards are starting to develop synergies with traps, um, you're probably going to be seeing a lot of play. Okay, so here we see an attachment called Dark Knowledge. It has a cost of one and is a condition attachment. It reads, attached to a hero, attached hero gets minus one willpower. Response, exhaust Dark Knowledge to look at one shadow card that was just dealt to an enemy attacking you. So I will admit I have never used Dark Knowledge, um, though I can see, particularly with some of the new um, expansions that have been released, that we have come across some truly brutal shadow effects. Um, I think in the context of the first uh, core set and some of the expansions, this is maybe not a card that gets much use, but I can see more and more people probably starting to use this as some of the shadow effects are just downright brutal. Um, now the minus one willpower is a pain, however if you attach this to a hero who is primarily an attacker or a defender, that it shouldn't play too much of a role um, in handicapping you and your team. Uh, it's cheap and that has a cost of one, and so this is only a card I would include in my deck if I knew I was in an encounter with just some um, game ending potential shadow effects or something really brutal um, if you want to be able to take a look and potentially cancel it. So Dark Knowledge um, is a card that could be used uh, in the right situation, especially if you have the ability to cancel a given shadow effect. So you can take a look if you have a really big nasty enemy and yeah hope for the best. So not a card that I've used, but certainly I can see this having utility, especially with some of the more recent encounters. All right, the last attachment we're gonna take a look at is the Protector of Lorien. Has one cost, is considered to be a title, and reads, attached to a hero. Discard a card from your hand to give attached hero plus one defense or plus one willpower until the end of the phase. Um, this has been errated to read, can only be used three times per phase. So that means you can only discard a maximum of three cards to get plus three defense or plus three willpower. I have mixed opinions on this card. Um, on the one hand, yes, it's nice to be able to boost some defense or boost some willpower if you really need to defend and save a hero from dying, or if you need to um, boost enough willpower to make it through an active location or move on to the next stage of a quest. But is it worth the cards in your hand to do so? If you've built your deck properly, if you're playing with 50 cards and every card in your deck serves some sort of purpose, arguably, and hopefully the cards you have in your hand will have more usefulness than the little bit of defense or willpower that you can give yourself. Now, this isn't always gonna be the case, um, and sometimes having that ability to get through lots of um, willpower or defense, or if you're using um, a deck with lots of card draw, you always have a ton of cards in your hand, and if you're able to recycle cards from your discard pile back into your deck, then I could see this card being useful. But you probably would want to um, build the proper deck to use it um, so that you always have a lot of extra cards in your hand and you have a way to cycle them back through. 
uh, which reminds me of a card we talked about last time. So we talked about Spirit. Uh, interestingly enough, Will of the West was a card that I said I didn't use very often, but I think here's a perfect example of where this card be could come in handy. So if you're um, boosting your attack and your willpower, you've discarded quite a few cards, well, here's a way to take your discard pile, put it back into your um, deck. And so if you have a lot of card draw and you have the ability to take your discard pile and put it back into your deck, then suddenly I think Protector of Lorien does gain some utility. So it's not a card I would just throw into any deck, but I think if the deck is constructed around this mechanic, then it can be uh, a potent card. <laughs> So for event cards now, we see Secret Paths has a cost of one and reads quest action, choose a location in the staging area. Until the end of the phase, that location does not contribute its threat. So against the right encounter, this is a useful card. Uh, we've used this many times, uh, particularly, you know, some locations can have a threat as high as four or five. And so being able to play this and suddenly have four less threat, you have to overcome that turn. Can certainly be useful. Um, if you really need to make it through a location or if you have lots of locations then I think Secret Path certainly is handy. Um, it's not necessarily a, a card I would include in every deck or against every encounter but certainly some of the encounters are built around having lots of locations and so if you know you're going to be going up against a, a location heavy encounter then Secret Paths is probably going to be a good card uh, to include in your deck. Now looking at a very similar card, Radagast Cunning has a cost of one and reads quest action, choose an enemy in the staging area. Until the end of the phase, that enemy does not contribute its threat. So very similar to Secret Paths, instead of choosing a location though, you're choosing an enemy. And this game, this basically has the same utility in that there are certainly lots of enemies uh, with high threat, in some cases as high as four um, or five. And again, uh, if you're in the right encounter against enemies with a threat like that, then this is a good card to bring along. Again, not a card I would always bring to every encounter, but if I know there's going to be lots of enemies with high threat and I need to make, uh, make it through in quest and perhaps my deck isn't so good at having lots of willpower, then this is a good one to bring along. So here we see Lorien's Wealth uh, has a cost of three and reads action, choose a player, that player draws three cards. Um, I'm not very big on this. Um, I feel like there's lots of cards in this game which allow you to generate card draw. I think this one is quite expensive with a cost of three and the fact you can only use it once to draw three cards. Um, the one thing I guess is that if your partner doesn't have any card draw then perhaps this would allow your partner to draw some but I feel within the lore sphere there's enough ways to generate card draw that this one is not um, very high value so not a big fan of this card I don't find it very useful um, again I'm always open to suggestions if people feel like they're able to use this card effectively but it just seems too expensive for what you're going to get and it seems like there's lots of ways to generate card draw in this game and so this is not a card I would look to include in my deck. Okay, so here we're taking a look at Lore of Enlodris. It has a cost of two and reads action, choose a character, heal all damage from that character. So we're seeing a variety of healing cards, all with different pros and cons. Um, this is not one of my favorite ones because it's just a one-time deal. Yes, you can heal more than two or one hit points. Um, if you have a hero with five hit points, this would potentially cure four of them. That's nice. Um, or if you have a hero with Citadel Plate and perhaps they have like six or seven damage on them, well, yes, this is a way you could heal all those in one shot. And perhaps if you're playing a deck where you have a character like um, anyway, a hero with five hit points and they're using Citadel Plate and you want to be able to heal them, this could be good. But when you compare it to some of the other cards like Self Preservation or Daughter of the Nimrodel that can continuously heal every turn, this one becomes um, less useful in my opinion. So for healing cards, Self Preservation with a cost of three and Daughter of the Nimrodel with a cost of three for just a one extra cost can heal continuously every turn, uh, two hit points. So I just think that Lore of Mladris, though, could be handy in one or two very particular situations. Uh, if you're looking for healing, I think using Glorfindel's ability and these other two cards would be more useful than the Lore of Mladris. So here we see a card called Gandalf's Search. Has a cost of X and reads action. Look at the top X cards of any player's deck. Add one of those cards to its owner's hand and return the rest to the top of the deck in any order. So this is a card that has some utility for sure, but is quite specialized. Um, as more expansions come out, there are certainly better cards, I think, for looking through your deck to look for cards to put into your hand. Um, if you are dying for a card like Steward of Gondor or Citadel Plate 
or unexpected courage or something that's really going to help you, um, I can see using this card. The problem for me is the cost. Um, to actually look at your deck uh, and hope for a certain card, you may spend three, four, five resources trying to do that and with no guarantee that the card you're looking for is going to come up. Um, those three or four or five resources could certainly be used to play other cards. Um, so I would have a hard time justifying using this card, um, particularly when you consider some of the newer cards are better at this. Um, in the context of the core set, yes, I could see this being useful in certain situations, but it's personally not a card I like to include in my decks. It is not something I've used very often. So just because of the cost with no guarantee, I would rather use those resources um, for something that I know I'm going to get. So this brings us to our final card of the Lore Sphere, and that is Bayorn's Hospitality. Has a very expensive cost at five, but reads action, choose a player, heal all damage on each hero controlled by that player. So this is a card that is expensive, um, but it's certainly useful in the right situation. So if you're playing against an encounter with lots of treachery cards, perhaps that are doing direct damage to all of your heroes, um, if you are more defensive and your partner perhaps is taking lots of damage, if you're playing um, like a hammer and anvil type strategy, or if you're just playing an encounter where there's lots of enemies, you're blocking with all of your different heroes, taking undefended attacks, and everyone's in really rough shape, then this could be a Hail Mary card to come in and save all of your heroes at the last minute. Um, it's very specialized, but it might be something worth including just to have in your back pocket in case um, you need to quickly heal all of your heroes. Um, it is expensive. Even if all of your heroes are hurt, there's no guarantee you're going to have five resources available. But if you can see that your heroes are taking a beating, um, you may want to start saving up enough resources to pay for this. Um, again, in terms of cost effectiveness, I feel that the cards we looked at earlier for healing might be a better option. Um, if you can play uh, a Daughter of the Nimrodel, for example, and just be healing yourselves as you go along long because you know she'll be there every turn I think those are better value ultimately than these one-shot deals especially something with a high cost of five so that's my assessment of Bayorn's hospitality okay so that concludes our look at the four major spheres for the Lord of the Rings living card game core set um, as I mentioned I will probably do a short video looking at the neutral cards um, but yeah that's the look at all of the four major spheres um, after this, I'm hoping to go through some of the adventure packs and expansions and look at those player cards. So look forward to that. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what you think is the best sphere or your favorite sphere. So um, as I mentioned earlier, for me, lore is not often a sphere that I play, though I'm starting to, experimenting with some of the new synergies they're developing. Um, so leave a comment uh, below and let me know what is your favorite sphere um, and why. Uh, so thanks very much for watching. Um, stay tuned for a look at the neutral cards. Um, but next video you watch, we'll be jumping in, I'm thinking, the Hunt for Gollum Adventure Pack series. Um, great, so have a good week. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>